What majestic trees. What powerful rivers. What beautiful animals, he said to himself. As he was walking alongside the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes behind him. He turned to look. He saw a seven-foot grizzly charging towards him. He ran as fast as he could up the path. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the bear was closing in on him. <laughs> he looked over his shoulder again, and the bear was even closer. He tripped and fell on the ground. He rolled over to pick himself up and saw the bear right on top of him, reaching for him with his left paw and raising his right paw to strike him. At that instant, the atheist cried out, Oh my God! Time stopped. The bear froze. A bright light shone <laughs> upon the man. A voice came out of the sky. You deny my existence for all of these years. Teach others I don't exist. And even credit creation to a cosmic accident. <laughs> Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament? Am I to count you now as a believer? <laughs> the atheist looked directly into the light. It would be hypocritical of me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian now. But perhaps. Could you make the bear <laughs> Very well, said the voice. The light went out. The sounds of the voice resumed. And then the bear dropped his right paw, brought both paws together, and bowed his head and spoke for what I'm about to receive. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> so we have been talking about seeds. Herbert mentioned it earlier. I mentioned it last night in talking about the seed that the that the human soul is striving to offer to the cosmos at midsummer, and then we talked earlier today about at what point is their seed and how it can be understood in different ways, and Dr. Salomon mm -hmm. even used the seed. So that brought to mind a poem that I very much love by Donna Markova, so I'm going to share that with you before I get started explaining why I put it that way behind me. I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it becomes a wound. A torch, a promise. I choose to risk my significance to live so that which came to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. <laughs> that was a lovely mm -hmm. sentiment given what we've been talking about. And it's nice to have poetry because it helps all the content that's being crammed in there to breathe and expand. <coughs> So these are photographic reproductions, <coughs> images that were etched in glass that are rectangular and shaped. <coughs> My sister Patricia Delisa is the artist who <coughs> took the pictures and then created this kind of circular sensation around the actual image, and then she swirled the color once she had it where she could work with it. So, if you go to the Steiner House in Ann Arbor to see these, they won't look like this. They're rectangular, they're in wooden frames, and it's glass, so the light can actually shine through it. Um, and we came into this project starting in about 1999 when the glass etchings showed up in the Ann Arbor community where I was living and working at the time. 
and as I was working with this, I became the one that began to work with these images and to try to create uh, a whole project out of this. This is the first step. Here we are, 13 years later, getting together with Herbert. <laughs> So um, I could have put these in a circle here, the way I do the traditional glyphs last night. But the challenge to that is that it gives the impression that we always come back to the same beginning. And we don't. We always come to a new beginning. So even though we arrive at vernal equinox each year as the sun is crossing the celestial equator, and you'll have to imagine this line right here is the celestial equator. It's just the equator of the Earth projected out onto the celestial sphere. So that's <coughs> straight, and then the constellations go around it. So this could be a circle going this way. I just took the bottom half of it and unfolded it. So you would get the sense that these are the constellations above, and those are the constellations below. And that, as we talked about last night, when the sun is here and the moon is full, it's down here. If the sun is here and the moon is full, it's up here. So you have this relationship between sun and moon. It's changing throughout the year. So this helps to visualize that more. So this is the sun zodiac. Margot Rosler also did planet zodiac. Uh, Ima von Eckenstein also did. I don't think she did all of the planets. I know that she, maybe her final, our complete zodiac was with Venus that was done in war. Mm -hmm. So Margot Rosler worked for years in creating the, the image that goes with each one of the planets mm -hmm. through the constellations. And I think I have, I have a copy of it. I think Herbert, you had something with you that shows that if you're interested in seeing it. But anyway, just to, to be clear, this is the sun zodiac experience. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do right now, before it gets really dark and we can go out and see something, is to build on what I tried to create as a foundation last night in understanding the traditional glyphs of the zodiac. If you don't remember that, if you weren't here, it, it won't inhibit you having an experience of this. But to refer to Rudolf Steiner's uh, lectures in The Search for the New Isis, the Divine Sophia, in addition to saying that this Copernican thought of the idea that the cosmos, co cosmos, <laughs> this celestial system that we are within, that it's just uh, a machine and things are governed by weight and measure and gravitational forces and inertia, that that is the grave of Isis, but also when we no longer experience the color streaming towards us. So the color is a very important element, and you could remove these images and just have an expression of color going through the zodiac and still have an encounter with what's streaming toward us as a humanity on the Earth when the sun is moving among the constellations. Mm -hmm. I've set it up according to when the sun is actually when these stars are behind the sun. This is what I have been referring to as the sidereal zodiac. It's different from the tropical zodiac. So that's why Pisces put right at the celestial equator, because the sun is actually among the stars of Pisces on March 20th when it comes to the point of vernal equinox in our time. So we are living in the Piscean age. At the time of the incarnation of the Christ, it was all lined up at the beginning of Aries, the celestial equator and the constellation of Aries was there. But because of precession, it's moving. It takes 21, what's 30 times 72? It's 2160. 2160 years for a precession to happen through one whole sign. So we're in the Piscean age now. So I'm going to briefly go through this and explain what these images are. Go what ahead. would come after Pisces? Aquarius. And where does that start? Right. <laughs> so, 100 years or so at least. 100? Yes, because if you, if you say that it's in zero degrees of Aries 2,000 years ago, the birth of Christ, then in 21... 
60 years from there, it will have gone all the way to the Pisces, and then it will start to go into Aquarius. It will take 25,920 years for it to go all the way around and come back. I'm going to give you some really sloppy math. <laughs> if, okay, what you hear about the Mayan calendar is that it's fulfilling at winter solstice this year, when the sun at its solstice moment is aligned to the center of our galaxy. It takes a lot to think about that. It takes a lot of abstract thinking, because first you have to place yourself on the Earth, get the idea that we're going around the sun, and that this planetary system that we're in is in this Milky Way that has its center, and that we, on our planet, are lined up with our sun, which is lined up with the center of the Milky Way. It's mind-boggling. So this is what you hear, that there's this alignment taking place. Well, if this happens in the year 2012, and it takes almost 26,000 years, this is where the sloppy math comes in, 26,000 years for the sun to process through the zodiac, and you've got this celestial equator, you have this galactic equator, then about 13,000 years ago, the sun was also lined up with the galactic center. If you quarter it, then about 6,000 years ago, it was at what we would consider, you know, I'll call it a solstice point. If you don't mind. So if you subtract 6,000, we're in the year 2000, that puts us back at about 4,000 BC, which is when early Christians started dating the creation of the world at that point. So something is going on spatially. It's being measured. And part of, I don't know if you've heard about Harold Camping. He was a gentleman that said that the world, the rapture was going to happen in May. And then when it didn't happen, he just oh, yeah, said it was going to happen in October. <laughs> well, he got his October date from this 16th century work by Archbishop James Usher, The Annals of the Old Testament where he gave this date, 4004 B.C., the evening of October 22nd to the 23rd, was the creation of the world. So Harold Camping said, okay, then it's going to end on October 21st. And I just read recently, he finally apologized. <laughs> At the time, he said, oh, God, just changed his mind. So there's a lot of misinformation or a lot of unsettling information. And whether any of that is true or not, it's still good to be settled and steady as we move forward, recognizing that we can engage in this process of becoming with the future. It's always coming toward us on the sunlight. That's how I experience it. So I would like to describe, in my words, my understanding of what Margot Rossler describes as what these images are, based on her research with Ema Beck Ema von Eckernstein's images from the original calendar of the soul, and also share what I like to say is that the calendar of the soul is also an astronomy calendar, because it was really an attempt to create an opportunity for the user to think about where is the sun and where is the moon right now. In addition to using the verses meditatively to connect with this, the mood but to have this relationship between sun and moon and self on the earth. It's a very important element that is not actively used. So, in an effort to resurrect that, here we go. So Pisces, as we talked about earlier today, this is the image as of Pisces is regarded as the fishes. And when you look at the constellation of Pisces, you'll see the way it's drawn, there's a knot it's a, it's a, in the rope that binds the two fishes together, the northern fish and the southern fish. And this knot has the name Risha. It's just above Mira, the miracle star that's in the throat of Cetus, the whale. And it's beyond that region where you have the Pisces, Cetus, superclusters, the stars there kind of, that I suggested were waiting to be swallowed by the whale to come to the earth. But this image is regarded almost as footprints. So the northern and the southern fish could be regarded as a footprint in the physical, one in the physical and one in the spiritual world. 
but they're connected. So even though we start at spring equinox with Pisces, I want to save that and come back to it. Pisces would show up again then, right here, if this kept going. So Pisces. Then we come to Aries, which is the encounter of the human being. Now remember that this is done, this was etched in glass, so it looks different than the image that you have in black and white that Herbert handed out today. And, and Margot Rosso talked about the challenge of trying to create those two faces in glass. It was not easy. So it more has this sensation of almost like a wing opening. But what is, is described in this image is the human being that is encountering the sense perceptible world as a result of the sunlight shining in that world. And that at this time, we have the capacity now to see this world ideally because our own inner light is strong enough that it won't be diminished. So if we were just blinded by the light, or we didn't have an inner light to understand what it is that we're seeing, to look within and to reflect on what we are encountering in the world, then Aries would be coming too soon. So Aries is meant to represent that. We can see into the physical world because we have developed the light to see in the spiritual world. Then moving into Taurus, Taurus has this wonderful sense of a, of a blossom. And what's happening in the time of Taurus is you witness the human being that seeks to absorb the surrounding world. And when you think about Taurus, I have it here because the, the dates are May 1st to June 15th. It's a long period of time. The Taurus is that that time in the cycle of the year when things are moving out and there's this trying to absorb everything that's in the world. Then, in the sidereal zodiac, summer solstice is actually occurring when the sun is moving among the stars of Gemini. Now, in the tropical zodiac, just to keep it confusing, <laughs> we say that the sun arrives at Cancer on June 21st, and actually it's only just arrived in Gemini. So it's almost two signs off the tropical zodiac when you get to this point in the year. So what's represented here by the Gemini twins is that you see the human being before the moment of solstice and after. And what that suggests is that a change has taken place in the opening that happens in how Margot describes it, that the zodiac is typically closed. But at the moment that the sun stands still, there's this opening. And we can have this encounter with the cosmos. So I showed this last night when I drew the image of Cancer here. And so that's when we are offering this seed up. It's the highest place that we can reach. And there's these new images of the zodiac, it's here's the human being before that moment, and now here's the human being after that moment. The yellow indicates that it's reaching up into the highest cosmos. And then begins the attempt to bring what we've received there toward the earth. And that's where you begin to experience the green of cancer. It's the rising up of the, the blue stream up from the earth, combining with the yellow coming down from the cosmos. And it has this very embryonic feel about it. So something that has been conceived in this moment between these, these twins Something is conceived, but then we begin to try to bring toward the earth. So this curve is now starting to come back earthward. Leo looks very much like the traditional glyph. You have this sensation as of a seed that has this tail that's still trying to come down toward the earth. In each of these images, you'll see the sun in the background. And that gradually starts to change as you move through. And so we have this wanting to absorb in Taurus. And then in Gemini, I'm going to put them down here. The Gemini is surrendering, it's surrendering to the cosmos. And then in Cancer, it's uniting, trying to unite with the cosmic forces, to unite the earthly and the cosmic forces. And then in Leo, striving to mature that which was kind of fructified here. So this is the real conception. And we begin to witness this kind of impregnation or 
what I have also referred to as these first six to eight weeks of the summer, going from summer solstice to mid-August as a period of time that you could call the organogenesis as in a normal nine-month gestation, the beginning of the formation of the major organs. Now, in the human being, in the soul experience of the cycle of the year, we are not building another physical organ, we're trying to cultivate an organ of perception. So this is what's occurring at this time of year while we're in this summer sleep, I'm trying to conceive a capacity to witness what's coming toward us. Rudolf Steiner says that the human being is the mediator between the cosmos and the earth, and that our task is to learn when does the cosmos want to know, or when do the heavens want to know about the earth, and when does the earth want to know about the heavens? And that the conversation between them happens through us. So this is a picture of that. And it's this striving to absorb that outer world, surrender to it, then unite with it, try to mature it. At Virgo, then, we come to this being embodied now. We are carrying the, new, the as yet unborn, We're trying to bring what we will birth on the earth. Virgo is, in this image, the, in the black and white images that you have, it looks much more like a child and there seems more symbolism. The child is carrying a, a ball that has a cross on it, whereas here, it looks just like a, a seed. This seed has become the child that's being carried in the arm. When you look at the constellation Virgo in the night sky, that, that seed or that child is the star Spica, a spica, a shaft of weeds, the star of abundance. If it's in the right place in the horizon when you're born, then it bestows that abundance on you, was how it was believed astrologically. So, bearing the newborn in Virgo. Now, the dates for Virgo go all the way from September 8th to October 12th. So, it takes in the autumn equinox. So, it really has more of a harvest mood about it. Typically, we think of Virgo happening end of August to the end of September. But that's the tropical zodiac. And the sidereal zodiac, it comes later. So bearing the newborn is the mood, at least in the images of the zodiac, from that time. Then we come to Libra. And I think I mentioned this one earlier, where you have this, this balance. Of day and night are of equal length. And it represents the human soul that can now perceive the mineral world. So if you have this sensation as though we're rising up and then coming back toward the earth, we can actually perceive the mineral kingdom because the Christ event, the mystery of Golgotha, has actually occurred and the Christ has united with the earthly forces. Hence the, the cross there, to symbolize that event. And it enlivens that world for us. Over here in Aries, it's the light of the sun that is making this world visible to us. Here we have this represented as the cross, meaning that the Christ being penetrated the earth and we can perceive the mineral kingdom, the mineral world. Scorpio, I have to share that the first time I looked at these images, what? Especially Scorpio. It's a hard image to see. No offense, Herbert. <laughs> but it's, it looks like a double-headed person. And it has to do with grasping life force as it lives in the matter of the earth and grasping it in a way that doesn't cause death. So it's side by side with death, but not dying. And that's what's represented in this particular image. You can, if you want, look at it more closely afterward. And then moving into Sagittarius. And it looks, you can see almost the face of an elemental being there. Mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner described these images as representing spiritual beings that are waking and sleeping throughout the cycle of the year. And we can encounter this. Where I live in northern Michigan, it's really easy in the springtime to see the groups of bugs that start to rise up as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And it's just, you can see it. Not not only the blossoms and the flowers, but just these little creatures that start to come up with this warmth. 
you know, when they're about this level, you don't want to walk on the beach. <laughs> it doesn't happen for very long. It's just a few days, and then it's gone, and they're high enough that they don't bother you. But it's an amazing phenomenon. So in Sagittarius, then, we have an image of the human being that is witnessing the astral sheath of the earth. So bearing the newborn, perceiving the mineral, experiencing the life force in the matter, now perceiving the astral sheath. In the sidereal zodiac, this is when Christmas happens. Sagittarius is from December 1st to January 4th. So the Christmas event is happening at this time. Then moving into Capricorn, and you can see the, the color shifting. And this is meant to be the peach blossom color of the human being. It's a hard color to reproduce. And in, in creating these, it's really hard to get the color exactly right. And if I put uh, these two together, these colors, this is not meant to be the same color. Mm -hmm. But it's so hard to, to the printer and you know, the way to do with that. Capricorn then preceding the astral sheet. And now this is the human being that begins to illuminate his soul. So having encountered the cosmos and tried to bring this seed toward the earth at the Christmas time, the winter solstice, giving that to the earth, experiencing the astral sheet, now trying to illumine one's own soul. And then in Aquarius, which is for me much easier to grasp than Scorpio, because you can see this element of thawing, something rising up. It's a very dynamic image. And this Aquarius has to do with being enlivened by earth streams. So at least up where I live, the earth freezes. And during the Aquarius period, which the dates are from February 9th to March 8th, there is the warming and the thaw that begins to happen. You can actually, an imagination that I have had in looking out over the Little Traverse Bay, which is a large bay on Lake Michigan where I live, it freezes over in the winter. And it's as though the stars have come down and they're frozen. And in the spring, when the thaw happens, you have this sensation as though the stars are rising. And it's a beautiful sensation. You see it in the blue and what's sparkling on the water. And you just have this sense of lifting up that's beginning to take place at this period of time. Then, from here, the next step is Pisces. I'm going to get back over here. And at this point then, throughout the whole course of the year now, we should have arrived at the point where we have so strengthened our physical body that it can serve as a sheep for the evil. So moving through this cycle of the year, both with the calendar of the soul and with these images, is an attempt to create an environment where we can have a sense of the rhythm and of the impulses streaming toward us that we can engage with. And as I shared, these images can be used to great effect during the Holy Nights from Christmas Eve to the Eve of Epiphany. If you recreate them during that time, then it's lovely to do it together as a group. Um, it's, it's very strengthening. And then throughout the course of the year, of course, you can go back. You know, so when Aries rolls around, you go back and look at your Aries image. And I, I play with it even, you know, I have Mars and Leo, and so I try to, you know, what happens on the night of Leo, and I want to know about Mars right there, and am I going to encounter the Mars being that night? Because if you think about the, the position, the physical position of the planets at the moment that you're born, you've heard this, that there's an actual impression on the brain of the human being of that cosmos at that moment of birth. But then, it's never in that position again. But what makes those positions so significant throughout the biography of that individual? And in trying to understand that, what has occurred to me is that there is as though a being that shows up to guard that place in the cosmos.